Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, Congress in recess soon, but behind the scenes, a lot happening on that infrastructure bill. Plus, more discussion on leveling the playing field between packers and producers. In Southern Gardening, it's no return to sender with this mailbox garden. And aquaculture up 10% in the ag census. Some producers are betting the farm on it. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. No doubt you've heard the word infrastructure many times over the last few weeks, especially as the White House has gotten closer to putting a plan forth to give the nation a facelift. Civil engineers gave the U.S. a C- in 2020. Closer examination reveals roads, levees, and waterways received a D. Congress has been battling for months over how to fund the work, but forging a bipartisan agreement has proved even harder. The Senate voted to move forward on its version of a hotly debated bill, the centerpiece of the president's campaign. Last week's Wednesday night vote was a procedural step, passing by a 67-32 bipartisan margin. Work now begins on amendments to the $1.2 trillion bill, Currently, it includes money for everything from airports, roads, and bridges to grants and loans for broadband and underserved households. Every American believes that roads and bridges, ports, waterways, even our digital infrastructure needs to be updated. They know it because they travel on those roads, go to those bridges, deal with the challenges of not having Wi-Fi to be able to do your schoolwork or your, or your work or get your health care. We're touching every element of infrastructure. If you're on the rails, if you're in a car, if you're basically wanting to get on the internet, uh, your bridges and your roads, everything, the airports, we've touched everything here. This is what's bringing America together, knowing that we can do something that's been needed for so long. The massive proposal faces an uncertain future. 17 Republican senators voted to move forward with the bill, but their final votes are unknown. The bill contains funding spread over eight years, including $550 billion in the first year. Roads and bridges are targeted at more than $110 billion. And more than $70 billion is aimed at modernizing the power grid. Other projects include railroads, water treatment plants, flood control systems, and port infrastructure. The focus on broadband acknowledges what was once a luxury in urban areas, now an important part of business and farming in rural America. More than $2 billion will expand access to help farms and Main Street businesses with broadband resources that were previously out of reach. The timeline for a vote on the bill was unclear, plus the Senate version would have to be approved by the House before reaching the president's desk. Congress is scheduled for a full recess on Monday, August 9th. A late addition, the Washington Examiner is reporting that in the infrastructure bill, there's a proposal to charge Americans a fee for every mile they drive. Such a fee, if it's approved, would not likely be implemented until three years into the eight-year spending program. In the meantime, the head of the USDA, Tom Vilsack, added his thoughts on infrastructure, including those on rural broadband and telemedicine. Clearly for farmers, ranchers, and producers, it's really important because our ability to export, where 20 to 30 percent of what we grow is ultimately sent outside the United States, we can be competitive in a global market for exports if we have a transportation system that allows us to efficiently get those products to market. The more efficient that system is, the less expensive it is to get product to market, the more competitively priced our products can be, the more of it we can sell. There are people living in a small community, maybe their work is located in the middle of a large city. The ability to telework, I think we've learned through the pandemic that you can work pretty effectively and efficiently from a variety of different locations if, and this is a big if, you have the technology that allows you to do that. Continue distance learning. Your child shouldn't be disadvantaged because they happen to live in a zip code 
that doesn't have access to broadband and therefore online learning is not as easy, is not as available as it might be to other students. That puts your child at a competitive disadvantage as they go on in school. If we're truly interested in keeping health care costs down, the ability to have access to health care in rural communities is, in fact, dependent on our ability to have telemedicine opportunities. Vilsack recently toured a wastewater treatment plant in New Mexico, emphasizing that improvements would aid the area in attracting new businesses. Meanwhile, we continue to focus on accusations of price fixing leveled against U.S. meat packers, with more than one investigation in the past six months. Last week, meat packers and producers were called to Capitol Hill to shed more light on the subject. Farm Week's Jonah Holland has more. In the wake of ransomware attacks, COVID-19, and consolidation issues in the livestock industry, the Senate Judiciary Committee brought lawmakers and corporate execs together. The COVID-19 pandemic, where there have been problems with supplies, wasted crops, shifts in consumer spending, have shown a bright light on the cracks in our food system that need to be addressed. The most significant challenge facing our industry today is labor availability. Supporters of independent cattle production say that with four major corporations controlling the majority of the meat supply, monopolies are on the radar, and that black swan events are no excuse for the disparity between packers and producers. I think it's unfair to say that they're causing the problems that we have, which is this great big discrepancy between what our cattle are worth live when we sell them and what they end up worth as retail beef. Lawmakers argued that better fiscal regulation of meat processing would level the playing field, namely transparent price discovery as opposed to alternative marketing agreements or AMAs that favor large packers. How do you justify making such low bids when you're turning such a significant profit? Thank you for the question, Senator. In the upper Midwest, a larger percentage of cattle feeders prefer to use cash basis as a life as a method to uh, to sell their livestock and as you go further into the south they prefer the AMAs so the AMAs guarantee a market for these specialized cattle but they also ensure that the producer is compensated for the value that, that they add to the market Cascading effects up and down the supply chain also dominated the conversation, along with ways to tweak existing rules in alignment with the president's recent executive order promoting competition across all American markets. As we forge ahead here and look at some of these specific industries, we also should try to find common ground on some of these changes we can make in general to the laws, because then it's going to be another industry, and then it's going to be online travel, and then it's going to be something else. Reporting for Farm Week, I'm Jonah Holland. As you heard in the story, four major companies control the industry, Cargill, Tyson, JBS, and National Beef. Meanwhile, packers have more to contend with than Congress. Meat safety, especially in a pandemic, is an issue as well. One USDA researcher in Nebraska describes how packers might be gaining the upper hand over pathogens like E. coli and salmonella. When the bacteria has not a very convenient conditioning situation for them to grow, to quickly replicate, then the bacteria can sort of entering like a hibernating situation. They can slow down their growth, but they can attach to the contact surface, the hard surface, to form this very thin film that you cannot see by naked eyes. We are trying to understand what kind of environmental background microspecies are work against these pathogens and we can use them for our benefit. It's kind of like a environmental friendly method. We can use it against the pathogen biofuel to reduce the contamination. In like three, five years, maybe we can get down to the more specific family members. So to use as an approach in the meat processing plants. On the lighter side, we visit former Southern gardening producer, Tim Allison's mailbox garden this week. After all his time working with Gary Bachman, he's become quite a landscaper himself. In fact, you might say that when it comes to color and style around his mailbox, he's got it signed, sealed, and delivered. Southern Gardening has been sharing Tim's mailbox garden since it was built in 2011. And over the years, I've been impressed with how it's matured. And even though it's just rain, this is the very best I've ever seen it. 
This planting features multiple layers of interest. The perennial bravado purple coneflower had become a mainstay with their two to four inch blooms of bright purple petals and dark center cones. And the tall multicolored zinnia mix well with the coneflower. I love the lower growing plants sprawling all around this landscape bed. Purple Wing has been a solid performer over the years. I really like the bright purple color. Purslane is a tough summer plant that thrives in our Mississippi heat and reseeds there every year. The purslane forms a dense mat and is covered with one inch yellow petaled flowers. I love the two Melampodium selections, the Million Gold and Larger Flower Derby. And the purple ping pong gomphrena look great tucked in behind the Melampodium. The clump of hardy banana plants anchor the end of the bed and the dark red flowers of the hardy hibiscus certainly adds interest to the mailbox planting. And while the sunflowers are starting to fade, the seeds will attract birds looking for a late summer snack. I'm MSU Extension Horticulture Specialist Gary Bachman, and I hope you'll join us for the next Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break, but please stay with us. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, Surf and Turf. It's all about sustainability. That's especially true out east for farmers whose crops come from the water like oysters. Aquaculture is growing big time and the market's getting crowded, so what do you do? You move inland. How do you do that? And will folks in the Midwest eat oysters? Some farmers and even the government are betting the farm on it. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. In Extension, we work hard to make sure that we're providing the best science-based education to our clients because we know that you need answers and solutions that you can rely on. It's natural to have questions and it's important to be able to turn to experts that you can trust. I trust experts myself for the health of my family's cattle and crops and for my health too. That's why I decided to get the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it was available to me. I want to protect myself, my family, and my neighbors from this devastating disease. And I want to get back to all of the happy times together that we have missed. So get the facts you need and get the vaccine. Let's all get back to the people we love and the activities we enjoy. Time once again for the Farm Week Market Report. A lot going on this past week. Things in flux on multiple levels. Zach's got all of it in his report. That's right, Mike. This week in the markets, we're giving you the numbers of the commodities we'll follow. We'll talk about the current state of row crops, specifically wheat and soybeans. And we'll also touch on lumber, all that and more. Markets continuing a downward trend, but not as much as it may seem. Most of these falling prices only slightly lower. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, lumber by about $12, but keep in mind last week it rose $98. Lean hogs also down by about four and a half cents, continuing from last week's fall of about 13. Last week's biggest gain, wheat up 19 and a half cents, reaching a high of over $7. It hasn't been up that much since May. We'll get into why in just a moment. So why the sudden rise in wheat prices? Well, it's not as big as it seems. Wheat was up past $7 this past spring, but as we said last week, we're in a weather market. 
Drought and dry conditions in wheat country still drag on and prices will continue to be high as a result. On a global scale, wheat production going as normal with a few lower yields here and there. That means we're likely to not run out, it's just that supplies are lower than normal. Market analyst Matt Bennett has more. The thing about spring wheat is that they just have had uh, terrible weather, you know, for that spring wheat crop. And then you come in here this week and you see the spring wheat tour and come out and they say 29 bushel uh, yield. The five year average for this uh, tour is about 43 bushel. So uh, you're looking at about a 14 bushel smaller crop. And especially when you're talking about 43 to begin with, uh, it's substantially smaller than what we're typically used to. The total U.S. wheat crop is going to be smaller. We know that mm -hmm. Canadian wheat crop is likely to be smaller uh, from, you know, from what estimates are coming in at. Uh, world wheat is going to be kind of steady, but uh, uh, whenever you see that much uh, in the way of weather issues with the spring wheat issue, uh, there's no question that the fireworks uh, were going to happen, especially whenever you look over to corn and soybeans. We've had a lot of crazy weather this year, uh, wild disparities from really good to really bad. And whenever you see parts of the country not getting any rain whatsoever uh, and carryouts as tight as what they are, the fireworks are not uh, anything that surprised me. In soybeans, prices down slightly, only about three and a quarter cents. And one of the reasons for it is the same as all other row crops right now, weather. Rainfall happening at the right time has taken pressure off potential low yields this year. On top of that, the USDA Crop Progress Report says the top 18 bean producing states, the majority of crop conditions looking fair to good. That all adds up to a potentially good harvest, meaning more supplies in the future. Once again, Matt Bennett gives us the details. You know, I think whenever it comes to soybeans, relatively speaking, you're talking two different things. Okay, soybeans are an August crop. We know that it's going to take a while until we find out what this crop looks like from a yield standpoint. Corn, uh, we've quantified more of that crop already. We know some areas are going to have a big crop. Uh, soybeans, we don't really know that anyone is going to have a big crop, especially in the heart of the Corn Belt. So uh, we need to get another two weeks uh, under our belt, maybe a couple of good soaking rains before we can start to say we think that this is a 50 bushel national yield or better. Uh, right now, the forecast doesn't look all that great. But I think part of the reason why beans got beat up so bad on Friday is that it was raining uh, in the northern plains. It was raining uh, in parts of Minnesota. Uh, and there's a cooler pattern advertised. So it kind of takes the heat off these beans, gives them a little bit of a breath of fresh air and maybe they can wait on rain just a little bit longer. As you saw live cattle up in price about six cents and one of the reasons for that is lower placements as last week's cattle on feed report showed us. Essentially live cattle rising for the same reason the past few weeks supply. However Matt Bennett says there's a little more to the story. So last week, uh, you know, placements were like 92.9, you know, and, and, and the market was expecting uh, something in excess of that by about 3%. And so, you know, basically you've got supply just a little bit lower than what people have thought. Box beef kind of uh, bottomed out this week. And so uh, I do think a lot of the supply issue or the supply uh, bullish information is already into the market, though. And so I don't look for cattle really to move substantially until they get more news. Uh, at this stage of the game, uh, fats, in my opinion, uh, over 120 are probably uh, rich enough for the time being, uh, but at the same time, I don't necessarily see them going down substantially. So we've been watching lumber prices rise in a big way this past year, only to see them fall big too. As we've been saying, much of that had to do with COVID lockdowns and the lack of labor to harvest and process the lumber. But there's another factor happening right now, wildfires in the Northwest. According to Forest to Market, both U.S. and Canadian companies scaling back processing. All that being said, they say there are two dynamics that will determine whether prices will rise again. One, housing prices. High costs means less being built. That means less lumber in demand. Two, supply. The wildfire compounded with post-COVID recovery and the specter of another possible shutdown means uncertainty. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Things are really in flux right now. We're dealing with ongoing drought and the consequences of that, which includes lower row crop yields, less food for livestock, and wildfires, just to name a few. And that's not taking trade into account. Bottom line, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, and markets tend to seesaw when that happens. Let's hope things will stabilize. Mike? Thank you, Zach. In our feature today, aquaculture, the latest USDA census says aquaculture has grown by 10% over five years ago. Long before our current trade war, farmers looked for ways to add value to their crops. That's also true for their colleagues in aquaculture, where land and sea meet for more opportunity. It's like planting potatoes. We buy our seed every year. 
We plant them every year, we harvest them two or three years later, and we just try to keep that crop rotation going. Point Judith Pond on the east coast of Rhode Island has been home for Dave Roebuck's Salt Pond Oyster Company since 2002. His aquaculture lineage dates back to the 1920s when family members harvested wild oysters. Nearly 100 years later, Roebuck is feeling a squeeze on the pond as more entrepreneurs are raking in the oyster business. In 2016, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration estimated oyster farming added $192 million to an aquaculture market that has topped $1.5 billion in sales. So the main thing about aquaculture is sustainability. It differs from the wild fishery where as the, the commercial fishing boats are dependent on the wild catch, they're at the mercy of the government and their regulations. And so with us, it's sustainable. According to the Coastal Resources Management Council with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, oyster farming in Rhode Island has grown 143% since 2007 with 73 farms selling more than 8 million oysters annually. The growth of East Coast aquaculture has put a squeeze on market share, leaving producers looking west to capture new markets. What we need to do as oyster farmers is get our product to people in the Midwest. Those markets are going to take take our markets on the coast and spread them out to the Midwest so that we don't have an abundance of product that we're trying to sell and compete against other farmers for in restaurants from, from Maine to, to Florida. We need to get people in the Midwest to, to enjoy eating oysters. Instead of following traditional sales models, many oyster farmers are taking on all the elements of the production chain, from upwell nurseries all the way to the restaurant table. Rather than selling the oysters to a wholesaler, entrepreneurs are delivering their product directly to their customer base. One example of Salt Pond Oyster Company's diversified oyster sales portfolio is Roebuck's Shuck and Truck. So we were trying to figure out how we could get that, that end value for um, our, our product. Uh, three of the oysters. And we said, how about, how about an oyster food truck? And we kind of looked up and there was no such thing as oyster food trucks, so we thought it would be a good idea. It's actually, it caught on pretty good. Ready on two scallops. Now we're, we're booked pretty much from June and th till the end of September. Opened in 2011, his food truck has been a staple for small town festivals all along the East Coast. Wow, look at this. For the better part of three decades, the Hankey family has been offering fresh seafood in the middle of the country. Sean Hankey, owner of Waterfront Seafood Market, uses his experience as a commercial fisherman to bring the freshest products possible to seafood counters and restaurants in Des Moines, Iowa and Omaha, Nebraska. Through all the years we've been here, we just go right to the source. See the fishermen or the docks where the boats unload, 90 plus percent of the time is where our seafood comes from. And it's, you know, quality is, is the key. Roebuck and Hankey see the biggest challenges for growing the seafood market in the Midwest are affordable and timely transportation. We can figure out the shipping because the shipping is, is pretty simple to do. You know, you can, we have air freight and we have uh, refrigerated trucks that drive to Chicago every day up out of Boston. So we can get our product there. You know, I don't want to charge our customers a fortune to eat these oysters. So I try to keep my costs down the best I can. So you've got to truck them because they're too heavy to fly. They go by weight. So you've got to find a truck. And I think that's going to be your East Coast guy's biggest problem is getting them to big cities, no problem. Refrigerated trucks, but any smaller places, you know, it's just getting a truck to get it there. One of the East Coast locations for Hanky Supply might end up being Delton, Maryland, where agriculture is meeting aquaculture. Along the banks of the Choptank River, some grain farmers are adding oysters to the list of commodities they produce. Using a grant designed by NRCS, the land and sea farmers work with USDA officials to help improve the quality of the river water, which many producers use for irrigation, and add to their bottom line. 
we've created a really good environment for oyster to grow. Plus, all the other little critters that are out there. It gives everything a place to hide. Plus, it helps filter the water. We farm the land and we farm the water. We farm the bottom under the water. Hanky will continue his search for the best seafood at a good price, while relying on his regular sources of fresh product. I would try anybody that wants to give me, you know, a sample, and I'll let my customers try them. I'll try them. You know, we try them, and then we make a decision. I just try to keep whatever the customer's happy with. <laughs> That's what counts. Niche markets aside, Roebuck is continuing his search for other pathways to get his product out of a crowded marketplace and further inland. We need people to to catch on to the to the uh, the healthiness and the the sustainability of oyster, oyster farming. Selling oysters in the Midwest, who'd have thunk it? Certainly not the most obvious market. <laughs> well, next week, a story of inspiration. You'll meet Rick Meister, who lost his legs in a horrific farming accident. A priest actually gave him the last rites, and in the hospital, he said his goodbyes, but he survived, and thanks to a special program, found his way back into his tractor. He says he never let the accident keep him from getting back to work. Rick Meister, next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.